That right there is a 22 horsepower water-cooled beast of a drone. But why does such a thing even exist? It has only one purpose and that's to go as fast as physically possible. Last year my dad and I broke the Guinness World Record for the fastest drone quadcopter in the world with Peregrine 2. However since then our record has been snatched away from us by a Swiss engineer named Sammy. So naturally we want to try and get our record back. Little did I know this would be the most challenging and expensive project of my entire life. And you're about to see exactly what happened. The prototype drone is finally assembled and ready for flying. And this is what it looks like without the cover on. Looks pretty crazy with all these wires exposed, but I promise everything has a place and a purpose. And we're gonna learn a lot from this prototype drone and figure out exactly what needs to be changed for us to break that world record again. We started out by just taking it to the field and getting some tuning flights in before putting it up to some real speeds. Things were looking pretty good, but before trying to do some proper speed runs with it, we decided to do a bit more bench testing, just to make sure everything thermally was under control. From there we took it out to our local flying field and did some higher throttle runs. In the beginning the tune was way off and this thing was super wobbly. But luckily with a bit of adjustment, we got it flying pretty straight and we got up to about 420 kilometers per hour, which we are pretty stoked with for this model. For our first prototype drone, we were actually using the exact same frame that we used for Peregrine 2. But for this particular project, we wanted to try something that I don't think has ever really been done before. We wanted to see if we could get rid of the traditional carbon fiber frame that basically every FPV drone uses and fully 3D print it. If we can pull this off, it'll give us a lot more freedom with how we can design the drone, place the batteries, move the electronics, etc. So if this works, it's going to be a big step in the right direction. Naturally, we went with the toughest and most heat resistant filament on the market, which in our opinion is the Fibron PA6CF, which is a nylon filament infused with carbon fiber strands. And this stuff is amazing. We've got three 3D printed giant Lego men here. In orange, we have the PLA. In green, we have Polymaker Pechi. And in black, we have the Fibron PA6 nylon. So we're gonna put all three of these guys in the oven and slowly heat it up. In the oven, the PLA man fell over at about 150 degrees Celsius and the PETG man at about 175 degrees Celsius. The whole time the nylon man stayed standing while the other two filaments just melted more and more into little pools. The PLA man is completely melted. PETG man is also completely melted and he's actually getting burnt a bit here and Nylon Man is perfect and still standing strong. So this really shows just how much better nylon is at heat resistance compared to these other materials. We took out the drone with the fully 3D printed body for its first test flight and it was at this point that the drone decided it actually wanted to be a break dancer and it didn't want to be a drone anymore. The reason that crash happened is, ironically, I had just changed the disarm button to a new switch to make it easier to disarm, but it means I hadn't learned it in my muscle memory yet. So I decided to fly my Sub 250 Huma drone around with the same configuration, just to ingrain it in my muscle memory before flying again. After properly practicing and learning the new button layout, we did a few tuning flights with the drone before taking it out to the field and seeing if this fully 3D printed body would actually work. And we're also testing out the RC and Power AR Supernova 3220 motors. And right now we've got the APC 7x9 inch props on there, but we've got these brand new 7x15 inch props from APC and these have a ridiculous pitch. Our previous drone used 7x11 so you can see that is a massive difference and these should hopefully give us the top end speed we need. Our first few flights with the 3D printed body actually went pretty well. The noise coming through the gyro wasn't too bad and we actually got up to over 440 kilometers per hour. The next week we took the drone out again, now with the 7x15 inch props, and we actually achieved a new personal record, getting the drone over 520 kilometers per hour. Unfortunately, because these propellers require so much power to spin, we had a not so successful end of our second flight. Which resulted in this beauty over here, 
and for obvious reasons we really don't want this happening again and what happened is our electronic speed controllers overheated and one of them actually caught on fire so I've got four brand new TBS Lucid ESCs here along with some thermal padding and this nice copper heatsink and what we're gonna do is put this heatsink on these ESCs and then we're gonna implement some water cooling into the drone and I know that sounds ridiculous but the current world record holder Sammy did the same thing and it worked amazingly for him so let's hope it works for us as well one of the most important things to get right when doing this is filling all the gaps up with thermal padding. This really ensures that there's no air bubbles and the heat transfers really well to the heat sink and then to the water. I didn't feel like the cop was going to work because the edges were a bit too rough and would probably leak water out. So now I'm cutting my own custom heat sinks out of an aluminium sheet instead and this is really cool. I'm obviously cutting it with the Carvera Air. And as you can see there, it's busy milling out the outline of the heatsink. So I'll show you here what we've got. On the outside, we've got our CNC aluminium heatsinks. And then the blue part is a 3D printed TPU gasket. And then in the middle, we did the water box out of the clear resin on the Form 4 printer. And all together, it just looks awesome. You can actually see the water there in the middle. And how this works is pretty simple. We're going to have all four ESCs mounted on the outsides on the aluminium heat sinks using a thermal pad. And then that's going to heat up the aluminium, which is going to warm up the water inside, which will hopefully absorb all the heat generated by the ESCs and keep the system nice and cool. I actually tried to print the water box out of nylon, but it didn't work and just leaked everywhere. So the resin print was just perfect for this and it's extra cool that you get to see the water inside. We're now gonna test how well this water box actually works. First we did the bench test with no water in the chamber and then we filled it up with ice cold water and ran the same bench test again. In initial testing, it seems like the water cooling was definitely working by keeping the ESCs with water in the chamber quite a lot cooler across the board. I realized the water cooling could be even better if the water was circulating inside the little tank. So I designed these tiny little pumps and I 3D printed them out of clear resin on the Form 4 printer. So this is the finished pump and the water comes in here through the front and then inside there is a little fan blade connected to the motor. So that spins really fast and then it pushes the water out of the nozzle here. I'm gonna plug it in and test it for the first time now with this little mug of water. Whoa, it's quite noisy. Look at that. <laughs> That's actually making quite a mess. <laughs> I've now put the pump inside the water chamber. You can see it there and I've closed this up. So now I'm gonna plug it in and we'll see if it actually does anything. Whoa, look at that. That looks like it's working brilliantly. I've just finished a print of this incredible new resin they have. It is the Silicone 40A, and this stuff is awesome. So as you can see here, I've got these little plugs, and these are gonna go in the water box where you fill it up with water, and it makes a perfect seal. And I actually tried printing these plugs in TPU at first, but because it's two times as hard, it didn't work properly, and would sometimes leak through here but this is perfect because it's so nice and soft and squishy. Of course, the next step was some test flying and these flights actually went pretty well. The ESC temperatures were much lower and we are much more confident that they wouldn't fail in the air anymore. What's great is we can also load the water box with ice cold water and we can see after flying how much the temperature has risen by, which just proves that it is absorbing the heat generated by the ESCs. I'm sure a lot of you are wondering why we went for water cooling instead of air cooling. And the answer to that is twofold. Number one, if we used air, we would need a massive amount of air flowing through the drone, which would create a lot more drag and lower the top speed. Number two, water is just really good at absorbing heat. To have the same heat carrying capacity as a unit of water, you would need about three and a half thousand times more volume in air. Of course, with one problem solved, there's always another problem that tends to pop up. Whenever we went over 350 kilometers an hour, we started getting these really bad side-to-side -side oscillations, which are obviously not ideal and gonna reduce your top speed. 
We tried different tunes on the drone over the course of about two or three weeks, but these side-to-side -side oscillations just would not go away. We're back doing our classic car window wind tunnel testing, and this time we've got a more advanced model. So in the sense that you can see we've got an adjustable COG placement. So this means we can move the COG forward and backward to see how that affects the stability of the drone. And we've also got little propellers that spin this time. So it's gonna give a more accurate drag representation of this model. The reason why this is important is because we really want it to have passive stability, which basically means that the drone will fly straight or tend to fly straight on its own and the motors won't have to use extra energy just to keep it going straight. With the center of gravity set all the way to the back, you can see that the drone is actually just inherently unstable and it settles in the sideways position, which is obviously not ideal. With the center of gravity moved a bit more forward, it's definitely better and more stable, but it's still not perfect because it does settle in that kind of weird angle position, which is gonna require a lot of power to straighten out at high speeds. We could easily fix this by adding a tail at the back, but this is just gonna add more drag and slow down our top speed. With the center of gravity just a little bit more forward, it's much more stable, and this is the kind of performance we're really looking for where the drone will tend to go completely straight without much intervention from the motors. During the entire design process, we've been using Airshaper extensively, which is essentially just a cloud-based virtual wind tunnel software. We've been using it to optimize every single aspect of this drone design to minimize drag and get the maximum speed possible. My dad also made an in-depth video about the design choices for this drone. It's really good, so I recommend checking it out and I'll put the link to it in the description below. Now that we've fully optimized this drone, it's time to manufacture everything and put it all together. So this project is the first time I'm actually using my Prusa XL properly. And I've got a dual filament print running here, which is really cool. As you can see, it switches between the nozzles there. What it does is it uses the orange to generate the supports and then the black is the nylon so that's the actual print that we want to be left with. Okay, the print is finished. So let's see how easy it is to take off the support now. Oh wow, that's brilliant. That just comes off so easily. Super nice. Wow, look at that. At peak power, this drone uses about 15 to 16 kilowatts of power, which is absolutely ridiculous. That's pretty much three average households running all simultaneously with all of their appliances and lights on at once in a device this small. And to power all of that, we use one of these batteries at a time. And these are the Speedrun Drag Series V4 from SMC. I have tried many, many different brands and SMC is by far the best quality. They deliver so much power in a size that's often lighter and smaller than the competition. If you want a full list of the parts and components we used for these drones, I'll put them in the description below. And we've got this really nice circular design where the lid just comes on like this and gets pushed into place and twist locked in. So that's really nice and easy to use. And then in the bottom goes our batteries. And then over that, we've got a tail which works the same as the lid. It's just got a little twist lock, so you push it in place and then you twist it to lock it in there. And that is the final complete drone. We are at this beautiful farm now, which we have been very lucky to use. The weather is perfect today, so for some reason I'm feeling more optimistic. Let's see what we can do. That was bloody quick. How many? Tell me. I think over five seconds. Yes! Look. I don't even think I went full throttle. What? Uh, we 100% for, let's check, from now to now. Okay, 570. 
Yeah, yes. That is good. That with, is good. with a dirty body, no, not sanding, some mm -hmm. tape there. The drone we just flew has a hole in the canopy for the camera to look through. But our final design has a closed canopy, which means that the drone will overall have a lot less drag and be even faster. So it was time to switch over to the closed canopy to see exactly how fast this drone can go. I took off the drone and my heart was racing. Months and months of work had led up to this moment along with countless failures along the way. With a beautiful sunset view in my goggles, I slowly pushed the throttle up to 100% as those numbers on screen climbed and climbed until we finally hit a top speed of 585 kilometers an hour or 363 miles per hour, a new unofficial world record. This honestly felt like an epic father-son moment and I am so proud of what we were able to achieve. Of course, this isn't the end of the project just yet. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss my next video where we're gonna attempt to break the official Guinness World Record in probably the most dramatic way you could possibly imagine.